travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Today's special guest is Diane Pershing. Nora is the voice of your childhood. She played Natosa on she Princess of Power. She's also Poison Ivy on Batman, the animated series. Now come join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, Ms. Pershing, and thank you so much for coming to the Traversing the Stars podcast. My pleasure. You've had such an extraordinary, extraordinary career. It's an honor to talk with you. Well, thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. And I always like to ask my guests when they first, um, as a first question, um, when did you know you wanted to be an actress and who were your earliest influences? Well, I knew from very early. I remember looking in the mirror when I was about five years old and I'd just gone to a movie, which I already loved. Um, And I thought, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. And then everything else followed after that I did plays in grade school and middle school and high school and oh, I mean you know that's, mm. that's that was it I knew yeah. and my influences were all the movies I used to watch on um on television and in the movie theater I used to go to um, two two three movies on a, on a weekend we had these kind of things for the kids drop them off at the movies give them money for popcorn yeah and leave them <laughs> <laughs> It, it, that was the older version of Netflix where you can just drop a kid and just turn on Netflix for a while and let them just go crazy for it. Absolutely. Day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, one thing I, I read about you that I thought was fascinating was that um, before you were um, a voice actress, you were an accomplished singer. Um, you were oh, a yeah. backup singer for Johnny Mathis and Margaret. Yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, it was wonderful. Actually, it was how I got into the becoming a professional. I'd always sung. And uh, in school, I was always in the chorus and I did musical comedies, very amateur time, you know, but I got right out of high school. I'm sorry, college, UCLA theater arts graduate. Thank you. Um, and I got out of college and I, I saw a, an ad uh, on, in Variety saying they were uh, looking for singers for a backup group for Johnny Mathis. And I thought, sure, I can do that. And I did. I got there and that's just, I didn't know that I would be a backup singer uh, for quite a, quite a long time. I was also a soloist, but really backup singing is where for the next 10 years, eight, 10 years, I made my living on the road, on television, stuff like that. I mean, the the fascinating thing about you're so accomplished. You, you're a accomplished singer, you're accomplished uh, voice actors, you're accomplished writer. So which love came first? Well, all of them. All of them. I always loved words. I was one of those kids that would read the dictionary for fun. A voracious reader. My mother would take me to the library and we'd do seven books a week and I'd read a book a week, I mean a day. And by the way, I am still a voracious reader. I love to read. So the words were always there. The singing was there. There was a lot of music in my house. My father played played piano by ear and my sister had a nice voice and there was a lot of music and the acting, I just knew I was going to do that. So I I can't pick one. I really can't. And the joy of my life, because I'm pretty old now, you know, and the joy of my life is I have had three separate careers, many of which overlapped each other. And I've had joy in all of them. So somebody who loves their work the way I do and to get such pleasure from that, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? I, I, I think so. I mean, most, most of us are happy if we can do one thing well. <laughs> you know, like, right. you know we, we, there's one skill that we actually have mastered on any level. We feel pretty yeah. accomplished in our life. You seem to have mastered three. <laughs> well, I don't think, uh, to be honest, I don't think I'm brilliant at any of them. I think I'm awfully damn good. But I don't think I'm, uh, I, you know, I haven't mastered three, but I've been, I've been able to make a living at all three. Which is still extremely impressive. Once again, most of us, one, one decent career. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, as yeah. someone who's a, um, you say, a voracious reader of, of books, and does having that understanding of words and their meaning and having that kind of um, vocabulary, does that help you as a singer and a voice actress in how you understand the words, dresses, things of that nature? Well, it certainly helped with the voiceover career because... Um, I could cold read anything. 
I could just cold read it. I didn't need rehearsals, you know. Um, and also, I knew the pronunciations. I, I rarely had, unless I was doing a medical um, narration or something, and there were lots of those silly, you know, long, mm. long things. But, but so it certainly helped in that. As far as singing, of course, I have, as you can hear, I, I have very good diction. This is just what I have, whether it's inborn or from childhood or whatever. Um, and as a singer, then I could be heard. My words could be heard. There was no mushing, mm. you know? So, yeah. You know, um, absolutely, um, as a singer, you have to hit many different notes and absolutely sing um, in different, I'm not even exactly well versed in singing, but I know it takes a lot of um, stretching of your voice and your vocals to, to do that well. Voice acting is the ability to manipulate your voice for different characters and also different motion for each character. Is there a through line directly from singing and being able to do those skills and voice acting? Absolutely. Absolutely. The way you talk, the da-da-da that I just did, the way you talk is, is music. It's music. And sometimes I hear a character's voice before I'm able to produce it as a kind of music. And um, it helped me enormously, especially... Um, all of the training I had as a singer helped me with uh, um, not getting tired, hmm. breathing. I, I never, you never hear me breathe on microphone. I know how to breathe without sounding like I'm breathing. You know, a lot of people go <gasps> in between or, or whatever. And I just go, and I've gotten a breath. So, and my diaphragm is strong tongue uh you get very your tongue gets very tired on during a long narration or or one of those um uh things where you have to be a dragon for seven different kinds of you know deaths or things like that mm. i don't get tired i don't get vocally tired because i'm a trained singer yeah you, you know i didn't even think about that as a skill breathing i mean it's something you just you know as, as someone who's not I mean, I'm obviously not an actor, voice actor at all. I'm not a singer. I don't do any of that stuff for many reasons, although my voice would not be good at that. But anyways, <laughs> but um, I never thought about breathing as a skill set. But the, as you're describing it, it totally makes sense. It totally makes sense in context. It totally makes sense. And it's actually one of the skills you need to have. I love it when people come up and say, you know, I'd like to make a few books. How do you get into voiceovers? Yeah. And I used to get defensive and irritated by that, of course. But now I go, you know, if you're any good, you have to go to classes and you have to study. You should probably do some vocal exercises. You should listen to a lot of other people and see what they're doing. And you have to be able to breathe on a mic without sounding like you're going out of breath. You have to be able to. And mic technique and where to stand in the mic and how to not pop your peas and how to all of those things. So it's it requires a lot of skill. Now, are you just naturally born good at that? Or did you go through a whole lot of, tra of voice training to be that successful? No, it was pretty natural for me. It was one of those things I was, I was standing, I know I, I was sitting, it was a, my commercial agent. I was, um, I was in her office talking to her about something and a guy walked by and heard me talking and said, have you ever done voice actors? And I said, no, not really. He said, come see me. And I went, okay. And he was apparently the voiceover guy at this agency. And the next day I had my first job. Oh, wow. That's an, that's an amazing. Um, I mean, it was, it, it was also at a time to remember now it's a market that is impossible to break into unless you're one of the very, very lucky people. But back then in the seventies, when I was doing this for the first time, mm. um, th there were people that were only voiceover actors and we we did all the work, you know? So it, it was, I'm not saying it was easy to break into, of course it wasn't, but it was a lot easier than it is today. Mm. Yeah. Now, as obviously someone who's also, like I said, a singer as well, you have, or at least I have not seen how singers have an, I, a better ear for things like pitch, and tone, things of that nature. I assume that also translates to your voice work where you have a better ear for the sound, what's working, maybe the um, how an the inflection of another of the other actors and how they're re please, um, reading their lines as a, that's better than the average person who doesn't have Well, I, I don't know that we're actually doing all that consciously, but I certainly can hear what I want to be up here. 
I can hear, but it's, and then I go, well, no, maybe a little bit, no, not higher, no, maybe a little bit lower about here, maybe that, and those kinds of things, right? And the mm. poison ivy voice, which is the one I'm famous for, they're going to put it on my gravestone probably, <laughs> but the, the poison ivy voice that I recorded was, I heard it in my, I mean, when I was auditioning for it, I heard it in my ear mm. and I knew exactly what it was and it, re it required a quieter, softer, sexier sound like that. See? Mm. So, and that just, again, that, I don't know if that's because I'm a singer. I don't know that a, a, a lot of voiceover people sing, by the mm. way, a lot of them. They have bands and stuff like that. Rob Paulson has a band and all these people have wonderful bands and stuff, you know? I mean, yeah, that's extraordinary. And um, Rob Paulson, a friend, um, a friend of the show, he's a fantastic guy. Um, but yeah, when, when did you decide that you're going to focus on voice acting? Oh, I didn't decide. It was a matter of I'd been on the road for so long as a singer and I was married then. And then we decided to have children. And I thought I'm going to have to stay home now. And the voiceovers, I would started doing the voiceovers, but now I knew that I need to focus on that because voiceover auditions took 15 minutes. The job, if you're lucky, I mean, it, it, you're booked for an hour, but it usually takes 15 minutes also, depending on, on the job, of course. So I could be with my children. I could raise them. So, so, so what were some of the earlier challenges that you had to deal with as a voice actress? Am I going to sound cocky when I say there weren't a hell of a lot of challenges? I was very lucky. I think that my life has been a series of serendipitous, serendipitous occurrences, such as somebody walking by, hearing me talking and saying, have you ever done voiceovers? <laughs> okay. And then the next day when I was in this guy's office, Bob Lloyd, who's now, you know, fame, who was famous, I don't know about your generation, but that's okay. Um, he was a real vo voice guy. And he's the one that said, come here and talk to me. And the next day I'm sitting in his office, I had told him I could do this. And the phone rings and the phone rings. And it's the people from JCPenney who have bought time at the forum for the Lakers games. And they wanted to do a 60 second spot, but they wanted a woman's voice because they figured a woman's voice would be good to break through all the male voices from the game. And he said, she's sitting right here. <laughs> And they sent me down and I was the voice of J.C. Penny in Southern California for seven years. <laughs> fate has been very nice. <laughs> exactly. Fate, fate has been good to me. I've never, of course, you have to help fate along by being um, on time, uh, know your lines, and not be a pain in the ass. <laughs> <That's the> point. <laughs> I can be a pain in the ass in my regular life, but not when I'm working. No <laughs> way. So I, mean, I mean, obviously, the you have to be good or fate doesn't matter. I mean, so obviously being good at what you do has supersedes the fate or luck that has come your way. But yeah. it does obviously help to have some wonderful circumstance from time to time. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful circumstances. And, you know, I, I wrote romance novels. You know about oh, that, too. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, that happened accidentally. I mean, again, somebody handed me a, a, a romance novel and said, why don't you? Oh, I, a, a relationship had broken up and I was de just devastated. And they handed me a romance novel to read. And I said, I don't read that crap. <laughs> I mean, excuse me. And she said, give me a, give, give it a chance. And um, I read it and I loved it. And I read 300 of them the next wow. year. And at the end of the year, I said, I can write one of these. And I did. And I sold that. But that was, again, serendipity. Now, was that after you were writing for The Love Boat? That was after. Yeah. So yeah, I, mean, I, had, I had that job. Yeah. That I mean, it, it's so amazing hearing like i said that um as, as the right i definitely want to get to some of the writing that you've done and some of the screenwriting that you've done um but one thing obviously i definitely got to talk about because um i know people are huge fans of it um shira now well, yeah i only did nitosa on shira 
Yes. I, I, I would not be cast today because she was she was black. Right. But she was I she was from the island. And they asked me if I could do an island accent. And I said, of course. And, and I, I did. And that's one of the fascinating things that once again is just um that time, the moment in time. Once again, as you said, it would be an issue nowadays, obviously, for the same thing as how society has has worked. Has it ever gone back and become an issue looking backwards? And people, you know, going back about characters and things of that nature. No, not not at all. I I I pretty much I no. Uh, that was filmation days, and filmation was a magical place to work. And thank God they they loved me, so they brought me in on almost every um, every every series, every animated uh, series that that they did. So I was very lucky. Now, if if um, my memory serves, you you joined Shira in season two. Uh, mm -hmm. with, with, like I said, with with, with Ntosa. Were you already familiar with the property of Shira prior? No, I rarely knew anything prior to going into a job. I was not particularly a cartoon fan. Mm. It just wasn't in my bailiwick, as they say. Is that what they say? I love that word. <laughs> anyway, it, it isn't, it isn't, um, it's still, I'm still not a cartoon fan, but I've made myself very much aware of cartoons because I go to the cons now and sign mm. autographs and talk to the people who I love. There's wonderful people that come to cons. I was such a snob about them before the first time. Not anymore. They're wonderful people. Yeah, yeah I, am. So. So I frequent conventions um, all the time. I love autographs. I'm, I'm an autograph nut. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, they are ex extraordinary. And I think one of the cool things about, once again, participating in a show like Shira, I mean, that show has become, or probably was even at the time, extremely important um, for young girls of, of that time period. Because I mean, thinking, once again, I was a young boy when that came out, I think I was six or seven years old, but there weren't a lot of shows like that for girls. I mean, we had He-Man right. as a boy, you eventually right. had um, <laughs> Thundercats, but girls didn't have heroes like that. Girls did not, girls were, were the mates of, the wives of, the girlfriends of, right. et cetera. Girls were not important. Right, and then once again, then you have a show like She-Ra, which you have kick-ass characters. You have um, the Tosa, um, I did read that you were Spinarello. Was that correct? Or yes, I think okay. I was that too. Yeah. 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 And, no, and I, 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 I had to refresh my memory on this stuff because this was 40 years ago. Mm. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, those are two characters. I mean, they're not the housewives. They are kicking ass. They're Spinarella is beating up the end. And when the first appearance beats up almost the entire rebellion by herself. I mean, she is considered a force. Um, the, uh, Natosa is considered a force. When did you realize how important those characters were to these girls? I don't think I did. I mean, I do now. Right. But back then, I don't think I was aware of the impact it was having or how important it was. Um, I was aware in normal voiceovers that women were making a breakthrough finally in a lot of the of the voiceover community that had been almost completely all male. Mm. I mean, I did narrations and I did, I was one of the first female that did um, uh, network promos, for instance. They never had a woman. Um, I was a groundbreaker, but I didn't know in cartoons that this was happening. I really mm. didn't. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, you were literally characters that had their own action figures, which was, which is pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, we're actors. We go in, they give us the script, we do the job, we go home. Often we are not aware of context or what happens afterwards or anything like that. Now, that, that you said, um, when you go to these conventions, I imagine a lot of those fans looking for your autographs are the ones who did grow up in, with She-Ra as well. I mean, I know Poison Ivy, we'll take that to later on, but uh, She-Ra, I mean, how does it feel to see these, uh, I guess now they'd be women, and still remembering fondly what you did with some of these characters? They're the children of the women. I mean, I, I, I'm talking three generations. Mm. Let's remember, you know, back then, 40 years ago, little girls became women who had children, and the children still, you know, and that's that's what I love. I love when they came up, they come up to me and say, oh, Oh, I watched the show after school. Everything was so important, you know, and I think, isn't that wonderful to know the kind of impact that you've had on people? That's kind of nice, you know? It's an extraordinary legacy that even just um, 
for a character, you know, like Natessa and Spinarell, who were in, in so many episodes, but still finally remembered the show, finally remembered. And it, the legacy behind that is extraordinary. It, it is for those who care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be very clear. There is a small amount of people. I mean, there's a small percentage of rabid fans and loving fans and people that care about this stuff. But most of the world doesn't even know it exists. Mm. You know, I mean, those of us that are at the cons, that's our world. But, you know, my friends have no idea what I did. You know, I mean, mm. I well, the the um, the original Shira show obviously had a bit of a resurgence because Netflix re had a new Shira show that came Absolutely. out, and the characters Absolutely. that you played came back. Absolutely, so they had to get the original a whole notice of a whole, like I said, a whole new generation who hadn't heard right. the character, but now, you know, you're you're the original. <laughs> yeah, I, I it's the same thing with Point Boys and Ivy. I'm the original. There's been some iterations since. But on the original saw, I get to I get to go, you know, it's kind of nice. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this and uh, a small secret. You're the only version people care about with Poison Ivy. <laughs> I'm sure I know others have done it, but you're the only one people care about because you did it the best. Oh, thank you so much. You know, I was astonished to find that out. I went on. Somebody told me I should go online. They're doing a poll on who is the best Poison Ivy voice. And apparently I won hands down and I looked at it and I went, really? Mm. that's of course i haven't heard the others i don't follow it mm. well i mean when batman the miniseries came out i was 13 i think 14 it was like right in my form formidable years and um you know i like batman i didn't i wasn't overly familiar with poison ivy because i had only sort of bought some of the comic books but i wasn't as big into batman at that moment in the, in the comic book world but poison ivy the um your episodes established a fantastic character and you know she was felt multifaceted she didn't feel entirely wrong either <laughs> with, with what she was doing. But, she was doing she was doing something quite noble, but she was also killing people, which is not good. I, I will agree that it's not good that she was killing people, but once again, she was just unfortunately she was one of those villains that you just was likable <laughs> on some level, you know? I know. <laughs> An extremely likable character. I know. So um having gone from Spinnerella, uh, Natosa to Poison Ivy. You have a, a string of very strong women that you've done. Yes. Are you, were you seeking, once you, you know, built your career and um, done a lot of these other, um, I know you were at other shows as well, Spencer Gadget, some of the stuff you did voice acting for, were you seeking out strong female characters or did something about your quality or, or your voice quality <clears throat> just had directors think you are the voice for strong character, strong female characters? I, I'm an actor and I hope I can do people that aren't very strong also, but the bottom line is my natural speaking voice sounds like a strong person. Mm. I just do. Uh, I'm an educated person. And um, I mean, I've been told this, so this is it. And also uh, capable of quite a lot of warmth in my voice. So those are the things that I usually got cast in. But when you say things like, were you especially seeking that out? No. The agent puts you up, you audition, you get the job or you don't get the job. You know, nine times out of 10, you don't get the job and it's fine. But I didn't have a career plan. I just said, let me work. Mm -hmm. I'm raising two kids. My husband died when he was quite young. And so I'm raising two kids alone. Get me work. That's really what it was. I mean, I imagine with the success of Poison, the character of Poison Ivan, how, how well received that was you had more choice to do what you wanted at that point. I mean, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, I did. The, I didn't even know poison ivy was iconic until six, seven years ago. Oh, wow. I had no idea. I didn't follow it. Mm. I just didn't know. And until all of a sudden this demand for me going, showing up at cons was, Oh, really? You know? Mm. Yeah, well, no, no, it, it, it wasn't even, and the show wasn't that successful right off the bat, you know, I mean, it, it built an audience, and it's never not been shown, that's why I keep getting these lovely residuals. Well, I mean, there's a lot of fans like me who are in their 40s and are still sitting watching Batman cartoons, which I mean, it's maybe it's some level of immaturity, but I will say about the Batman episode, and obviously a lot of the ones we're in as well, transcended kids cartoons, they were absolutely. Adults on some level absolutely it it appealed to both age groups 
Yes. It really did. It had something for the kids, but it also had something for their parents. Too. They could all watch it together, you know? So when, when you see the, the role of the po- of Poison Ivy, once again, there's a character who technically in the world of comic books had been around for 30 years, I believe. Um, what did they tell you about the character and what character traits about the character did you want to emphasize in your portrayal? Oh, well, when I got the audition, I knew exactly who she was immediately. I saw the picture, which, you know, I described she's like a, a Tinkerbell on hormones. You know, she has a <laughs> green curvy thing. Yeah. But anyway, um, I saw her. She was not just Poison Ivy who used her sexuality to attract men, mm. which is this voice. But she was also Dr. Pamela Isley, which meant she was a PhD, which meant she was smart. So you just infuse the sexy part with a little bit of crispness, a little bit of something. So you know there's a brain operating. Mm. That's what I knew about her. And that's and then the writing, the writing staff, bless them, wrote me juicy, wonderful parts. I mean, her first her first episode with um, Harvey Dent was in it. And, you know, where is a mystery a little while if, you know, who the villain is. And she's kind of playing coy a little bit like that. I mean, that's a complex character in, in a very 20, short 20 minute episode. You get you learn a lot about who she is. You, you exactly. Get a sense of depth from her as well. Because once again, yes. she's not the Joker. She doesn't come in. And you're like, oh, there's your bad guy. You know, it takes a while. You're like, oh, oh shit. No, <laughs> no in, in fact, at first, you know, Harvey can't wait to introduce her to Batman. And isn't she special? Isn't she wonderful? And then there's the kids. Yeah. <laughs> and it, like I said, it was it's so well done. And I mean, the nice, the great thing about Batman animated series is that some of the voice actors, I mean, you had some legendary groups. You mean Kevin Conroy, Mark Hamill, Arlene Sorkin. And once again, there's you. What was it like? Did you get to work together on stage with yes. the voice acting? Yes, Good. this was this was such a joy. We worked, you know, in a semicircle. Each of us had our own mic and our own music stand. But we got to look at each other, which means we could react off each other. And that is so different from the piecemeal thing that they do now. You mm-hmm. know, just so and so is in Hong Kong. We're going to have to record him at three this three in the morning. You know, etc. That's what's going on now, which is perfectly fine. It makes perfectly fine shows. But I still maintain, like radio shows in the old days, that if you are all in the same room and you could, we were all stage actors, all of us, mm. all of us. Ephraim Symbolist Jr. was next to me on this awesome. side when I recorded, and Mark Hamill on this side. Excuse that's awesome. me. Awesome. <laughs> that, that's, I mean, when, when you were acting together like that, were you just acting with your voice or did you start acting with your whole body because you were playing with off each other? Most voice actors use their whole bodies. I, I mean, I'm just talking to you. I'm using my hands and I'm, this is how it is. You don't just do, oh, Batman. You know, you do, oh, Batman, because that's what your body wants to do. That, that, like I said, that must have been incredible acting with everybody. And I think one of the coolest things that they ever did with their character is when they introduced Harley Quinn's re- connection with Poison Ivy. That was such a beautiful um, connection with these two characters that didn't seem like it would necessarily would have made sense until you see them together. Like, that's perfect. Who, you know, that, why, why, that, why did that take so long? <laughs> no, it's, it's just, uh, it, it was, again, it was serendipitous. For some reason, they, you know, they wrote that episode. Uh, where the two of them get together and it was like, and also Arlene and I played off each other. Well, you know, yeah. we just, we had an instant connection as people. I'm we're, we're still friends. Oh she's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, she's when Arlene Sorkin be, uh, took the role of Harley Quinn, she was new to voice acting. You had already been a veteran. Were there yeah. advice or, um, you know, some sort of um, lesson that you were able to help her with to make her better? Nah, nah. She no. was a natural. They they wrote the they wrote the part for her. You know, she had that voice that I yeah. don't know if you yeah. know Judy Holiday. She had that voice from mm. way back. Okay, but they wrote. That's how she talks. And she's also she was a writer and a comedian. She'd been on TV. She's an actor. Yeah. So she didn't she didn't need help from anybody. Well, I, and, I mean, in the characters on the show, obviously Poison Ivy was a little more of like the older sister, the, the wiser one. Um, Harley Quinn, you know, was kind of the mess, more messed up because she had just left the Joker and everything else. 
and but they became good friends and did it automatically connect with you two that you became friends early on did you have the older sister younger sister relationship oh n- no no as a matter of fact later on when we did um, gotham girls is when we got to be friends friends more. I mean, we, we went out after and had coffee kind of thing. Uh, in the, I'm just saying during the recording of the um, Batman, the animated series, we were just on, on set, very collegial, you know, mm. but, um, but, but I liked her right away. She liked me. I mean, but it just wasn't anything. No. And, and I think another thing, I mean, obviously your character proved so popular. She shows up later in Static Shock. She's showed up in Justice League. I mean, were, were you surprised when the roles and all these other shows, you kept coming back to you over and over again for more and more Poison Ivy? I was not surprised. I was pleased. Whenever, again, remember, I this is my work. And my work depends on getting hired. And so I don't think I think of it as, oh, they still want me. No. Oh, you want me? Great. I'll, sh- I'll show up. I'll be there. You know, mm. I, I don't, I don't, um, I, I'm a journeyman. You know, I, I, I do you send me where I go, give me the money, let me do my work and I'm happy. And, you know, and I think it's kind of amazing that you're like, people still, you know, they're, they're, the role that you're most famous for is um, Poison Ivy. Um, Cause like I said, that character is just, you know, just an incredible character. Like I said, and as a fan, you know, thank you. Um, is that, is that, I mean, obviously, I would imagine when you go to conventions, is it stronger for most fans from Batman anime series or from some of your other shows that you've done? It's, I would say it's 90% Poison Ivy, the people that show up. There are a few others that loved all the filmation stuff, you know, and at Pearl Pure Heart on Mighty Mouse and, and uh, oh, and, and there's also Centurions, you know, that's, mm. uh, that was, I think I was the robot voice on that. I guess I was. Yeah. Mm. I don't remember, but yeah, no, there's some, <laughs> some great stuff, but mostly it's 10 per, 10% other stuff, 90% poison ivy. Yeah. And, and, and did you find it, is it the audience pre- pre- predominantly uh, girls or, or a lot of boy fans? Both. 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 And I love when the women come up and say, I mean, there was one woman that came up and said that, um, she loved the episode when Poison Ivy told Harley that she must not let the Joker treat her that way. Yes. That she yes. stand up for herself and don't let a man walk over you. And she said she had been in a ho- raised in a home where there was a lot of abuse. Mm. And she didn't know there was another way to be until she saw that cartoon. Oh, wow. And she wow. was in front of me with tears streaming down her face. And I thought, wow, I really had an impact. Not a- I've, but you know, the show really had an impact. Wow. Well, I would say you had the impact. I mean, once again, your voice, you gave life to the character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you also have to remember the writers wrote the words that, that I said, and the sound technicians made me sound good. And the, the animators made the, you know, so I don't think of it as I did this wonderful thing. I really do think we did, but I was very pleased to be part of it. Well, like I said, I think that that really is the genius of the Poison Ivy character. And I think it made her character better, like I said, when Harley came in, because you did have, I think it established her, her, the strength of who she is as well, Poison Ivy. Because, you know, before you obviously had her with, um, you know, Harvey Dent, she's kind of more villainous, but you do get, give her, I think, more of a heart when Harley shows up and give her someone to care about, you know, who legitimately cares about Well, it, it is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, she she probably hasn't had girlfriends. Mm. You know, Poison Ivy. I mean, and and she also, she's the steadier one of the two. I mean, she's crazy. Yes. But she's the steadier one who's, you know, Harley's batshit crazy. I mm. mean, let's face it, you know, she's wacko. Yes. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and I was wondering, like, when, when in that episode with, when the Joker does show up and Poison Ivy is interacting with the Joker, there seems to be a little extra anger there. Like, she seems to, you know, of um, from Poison Ivy's character that, seems to have a resentment for the Joker, not because just because he's a male, but because of how he treated Harley. And Definitely. When, you purposely added that little extra. Re- Definitely. Resentment. Definitely. I don't. And even then, as a person, as a human being, I would resent any man that ran roughshod over a woman. So, of course, I utilize that. 
And like, could you tell right in the scripts when you were reading it that how successful this, how well done these stories were? I did because I'd, I'd been in a lot of shows that weren't as well written. And mm. um, these, these people knew what they were doing. It is their hearts. I mean, they really are. Um, I think when, I mean, people list the greatest cartoons ever made, Batman tends to be number one. And like, it's always the one that they point to first. Yeah, yeah. So like, which is weird. Once again, it's a superhero cartoon. So you would, it's, you would think you could easily dismiss it, but it's just so many layers to the show. And like I said, like Poison Ivy, I think one of the examples too, that it, they did so well with the character that even the comic books had to change their character to make it work. Could people like exactly. the cartoon work better? <laughs> exactly. Well, we had a, we had a lineup of villains. So, you know, I didn't do every show, obviously I was, whenever it was time for my person to be up. You know, so each each bad guy got X amount of shows, you know, just Kevin and Lauren got, you know, always got, you know, we're always on. Uh, but um, yeah, it was great. It was great. I, and I'm just saying as, some, as a writer, you need to write some Poison Ivy comic books. Just you have the skills and you're the voice. You got to do it at some point in your life. You got to talk to somebody. I don't, <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think I can think like that anymore. Yeah. You know, I really, I really, I mean, I still write. I, I, I wrote a film column for five, five years, which was fun because I love movies. So I, I did it for a small newspaper. And, um, and it, I still write a lot, but just um, for me, you know. Now, when you said you wrote a film column, was it reviews or was it analysis? I reviewed. I was a reviewer for, for the Malibu Times in Malibu, yeah. California. And cool. it, it, was, it was a fun gig. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Did did you, see a lot of movies. did you seem to have a better insight because you know the process better because you've done things like animation and acting that you have a better sense of what was happening? I think so. I do think so. I've never approached films as a scholar, which your scholar is an outsider, you know, mm -hmm. who's who's observing. I always approach them probably as an actor, but also a film buff. I mean, I've mm -hmm. been I mean, I'm nuts when it comes to movies. So, yeah, I'm definitely a, a, a filmophile as well. I, I love movies. I, I watch them. Unfortunately, with COVID, I didn't have been able to watch as many in theaters as I used to. But yes. <laughs> it's still a, a great yeah. experience. By the way, I just saw Drive My Car. Have you seen it? I have not seen that one yet. Oh, my Lord. It's so good. Yeah. It's three hours long. It's the one from Japan. That's the, the it's going to win the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film. Okay. There's no good. I, I'll good. definitely. I'll definitely check that one out. I mean, like yeah. I said, it's good to hear someone who knows movies tell you that that's the movie to watch. That's, you definitely got to sit down and watch that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I will admit probably the next movie I'm going to end up seeing uh, in theaters is going to be The Batman. It's, it's uh, the, the geek thing. I have to do it. <laughs> okay, go, go for it. <laughs> so um, as you mentioned, also, you also are a very successful romance writer. Um, so what is it about the romance books or what part of yourself are you able to express through the writing of romance novels? Well, I wrote them for 20 years. I haven't written one in 15 years. And those, I have to be very honest. I got a lot of my feminist stuff in there, in the books. Mm. Um, I, I never wrote a female who was um, helpless or a victim. And also during those years, I think I was basically unattached romantically so I could write a lot of my fantasies and a lot of my wishes and dreams mm. um, and also sense of humor my, my books have a good sense of humor so um, I enjoyed them I, I enjoyed it it was a, a little bit of a sideline you don't make huge money unless you're one of the really top names and I was not I was a good mid-list author um, and I loved it. And then after my last one, I went, man, yeah, I think I'm done with that. And that was it. So, I mean, I was, from someone like, and, and on, on the side, I do my own writing. And I do find that writing is something that gets in the blood and you, it's hard to walk away from. Do you, what, what are you doing now for your um, literary outlet for writing? Well, I write very lavish emails to various people. <laughs> that's really that's really what I do. I did a few years ago. I wrote a bunch of memoir things that I performed in the spoken word kind of things. That was fun. I like that. Um, but I don't know if I'll do that anymore. I really don't know. So, um, what, what's next uh, for you? Life. I, I 
I recently moved from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. to be with my son and his wife and my grandchildren uh, because I'm aging and I want to be near family. Mm. Um, my son, by the way, plug, 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 is the politics editor for the Wall Street Journal. He's nice. Kind of a big, he's kind of a big shot. He's a writer, obviously. He's always welcome on the show. <laughs> okay, and and my my daughter is uh, in management, um, one of the top tier management at the Sacramento Public Library. So I have literary children that you know. So I love them and I love being here with them, but I'm still adjusting. I'm just finishing unpacking boxes. So what's next for me? I don't know, but I'll probably get involved somehow in the theater, the music, whatever life that's here. Well, yeah. hopefully one day you come towards the Northeast and do some combo conventions because there's a lot of people here who probably want your autograph. So please where stop. Where uh, are you? Uh, where, at, where are you? Uh, Rhode Island. Oh, you're in Rhode Island. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, there's it seems to, we don't always get the best guests um, come towards our side. So you got to come to uh, Northeast and you get some things signed. <laughs> OK, well, let me know. Um, let, let me know the name of the cons that you are they're familiar with. And I'll tell my managers. I 100 percent definitely will. Um, what I think what I do as well is um, the cool thing, is the, the big one in Rhode Island called Rhode Island Comic Con. They have guest suggestions. So you can always type in suggestions. I and they can type in I type in your name be like, hey, let's get Diane Pershing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to go up there. I haven't been to Rhode Island. It, it, it's it's nice. It's better if you not if you don't go during the winter. So you want to try to get, find one of the shows in the area during the summer. But it's um it's it's, it's actually a pretty big show. I think they get like fifty thousand um patrons uh um for at the convention. So it's it's a pretty good one. That's a very nice one. Sure. So uh, great. Uh, yeah. So I plug them as well. So hopefully they, they do it. Uh, but either way, uh, Miss Pershing, it's a great pleasure to talk with you. Um, you made some of the best shows I remember watching growing up. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Okay. You too.